Okay, today is our first class on civil procedure. <coughs> the overview of civil procedure, it's always good to start with sort of a big picture of what's this really all about, is shown here in these steps. And the clearest way to see and understand this is to think of it in terms of the chronology that one follows in going through a lawsuit. And the natural steps that you would follow in going through a lawsuit there are civil procedure issues which occur at each of those steps. And knowing the solution to those is what the bar examiners want to see. Uh, today we are focusing primarily on the federal rules of civil procedure. There will be a separate uh, lecture as I did with uh, uh, evidence dealing with the differences between the California and the federal rules of civil procedure. In following a lawsuit from beginning to end, we begin with a complaint. Plaintiff files a complaint. There are issues, there are things that are required in the complaint, and the bar examiners want to know if you know about those. Demur. The defense might demur, saying you haven't stated a cause of action. And if you do that under the federal rules, that's called a 12 v. 6 motion, which is a motion claiming that the uh, plaintiff has failed to state a claim for which relief can be granted. So you file a complaint, the person might demur, saying get out of here. Uh, <clears throat> if you lose on that, then the next issue is jurisdiction. Uh, the defendant might claim that the court lacks personal jurisdiction or subject matter jurisdiction. And as you can see on the board here, we have the details of personal jurisdiction, and we'll be going through these. Personal jurisdiction requires a basis, long-arm statute, and notice. And we'll go through the details of each of these, because about half of the problems on civil procedure uh, on the bar exam are about personal jurisdiction. So this is a big deal. So getting back to our basic structure in a civil procedure process going from beginning to end of a court case, complaint, demur, or 12b6 motion, jurisdiction, then there may be a motion to change venue. That happens in one of our problems today. That is, even if the court has uh, subject matter and personal jurisdiction, there may be other courts that also could have subject matter and personal jurisdiction, and there may be a motion to change venue to one of those other courts, and the rules about that need to be considered. Uh, then the answer, uh, not much to say about the answer, but a few things. Uh, Erie Doctrine, once you have uh, gone through the answer here, you now have a suit, you have a complaint and an answer, and the court has jurisdiction and you're in the right court. And so what Erie Doctrine is about is, are you applying the right law? Are you going to use federal or state law? Now obviously if it's a federal case, you're going to have federal law and there's no problem. If you're in state courts, you're going to have state law all the way through and there's no problem. The problem occurs when you are in federal court based on diversity. And if you're in federal court based on diversity, now you have sort of a split set of rules. You use the state substantive rules, but federal procedure. And there can be some close cases where it's not so clear whether a rule is substantive or procedure. And we'll be looking at that. Then, so now at this point, we're, uh, we filed a complaint. A uh, person tried to dismiss it. It didn't go away. Court has jurisdiction. We're in the right court. The person has answered it. We know which law to use. Now we go to discovery. This is where each side, of course, tries to determine uh, what evidence the other side has and uh, what evidence it has <coughs> to make out its, uh, its cause of action. And when you try to determine well, what the other side has, of course, you run into problems. You interview witnesses, you depose witnesses, you send out interrogatories, requests for admissions to things, you inspect land, you inspect objects, etc. And as uh, you attempt to do this, there are various problems which occur, and the bar examiners want to know about those issues. Not extensively, but enough so that uh, we, there are just six tools of discovery 
under the federal rules and they want to know that you know how to use each of those six rules of discovery. Uh, <coughs> then at some point there may be a motion for summary judgment. It doesn't have to occur after discovery. It could be that even before discovery uh, you have enough to make a motion for summary judgment. But more likely after you have done some discovery you know what they've got, they know what you've got, then comes the time for the motion for a summary judgment. Summary judgment is basically saying we don't need to uh, uh, go to a 12-person jury to determine what happened here because the, uh, from, the, uh, 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 from what we have now you can plainly see that no one could vote for the other side. No rational juror could vote for the other side so we may as well settle this now and give me give a judgment in my favor. That's my motion for summary judgment. If it is the defendant who is making the motion for summary judgment, the defendant will do a similar thing. The defendant will say that uh, no rational person, no rational juror could vote for the plaintiff. And so there's no point in us going to a 12-person jury. We can decide right now that I win. So each side can make motions for summary judgment and the rules for that, of course, can be tested. Joinder, this is a case where uh, we may want to join additional parties or additional claims in the lawsuit. Uh, if we want to join additional parties, the additional parties that we want to join may be uh, uh, compulsory joinder, that is to say we are required to join those people or we'll get dismissed, or permissive joinder where we want to join or they want to join into the lawsuit. The, um, finally comes the, the pretrial conference where the parties meet, make their final attempt to settle the case and uh, uh, the, brief, the, then comes the trial motions. At the trial itself there are certain motions that can be made. Uh, the, uh, after the plaintiff, for example, has put on the plaintiff's case, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, defendant might say a motion for non-suit, saying in effect that even if you believe everything the plaintiff has said, they haven't really made out a cause of action yet, so dismiss. So you can, that's a trial motion. Secondly, as after the plaintiff and defendant have both put on their case, either side might ask the court, don't even bother to submit this to the jury because as a matter of law, I win. Another trial motion, that's here, these are trial motions. Uh, also a judgment notwithstanding the verdict of the jury is another trial motion, so we need to know about those. And finally, the post-trial motions, uh, the uh, post-trial motions, motion for a new trial, uh, an appeal, and also very important here are what is res judicata and collateral. In other words, what issues are get, are decided? The doctrine of res judicata and collateral estoppel apply to those issues which have been or or causes of action which have been decided, and uh, those come up uh, sometimes way back here in these uh, motions to dismiss, like summary judgment. You might, uh, if the suit, if the cause of action has already been brought once before, you may get summary judgment or maybe you get a demur back here. So res judicata and collateral estoppel can come up in these earlier stages when you claim that the other side doesn't have a lawsuit anymore. They don't have a lawsuit because these matters have already been litigated. Or even if they have a lawsuit, there are certain issues that have already been previously litigated decided in your favor and therefore you want the court to, the, want this new suit to proceed with the understanding that these issues which have been previously litigated and found in your favor, that, that those are a predetermined uh, facts in the lawsuit. This is the layout of civil procedure and the uh, things that uh, bar examiners wanted to know. We're going to focus today primarily on personal jurisdiction and some of the other issues that come up also. Uh, the, uh, let's start here just to make a few comments about the complaint and the demur, then get right into the issues on personal jurisdiction. 
First, the complaint itself. The complaint, uh, there are basically two uh, uh, types of jurisdictions for filing a complaint. There is the, uh, there are the notice jurisdictions, which the federal rules follow, and then there are the fact pleading jurisdictions. In the notice jurisdictions, the only thing you have to do in your complaint is to provide enough notice to the defendant of what the transaction is that you're suing about. You do not have to identify the, the name of your cause of action, exactly what your theory is. <clears throat> you don't have to have a theory yet. All you can say, you can say uh, that the plaintiff, you're the plaintiff, you say the defendant and I had an accident at the corner of A and B Street and I'm suing for the harm caused by that accident. So you identify the transaction or occurrence, but you don't have to identify the theories of your lawsuit. That's in the notice pleading jurisdictions when you file a complaint, and the federal rules follow notice pleading. On the other hand, when uh, if you're in a fact pleading jurisdiction, in the fact pleading jurisdictions, you must actually identify or state your causes of action and state what facts you intend to prove such that if these facts are established, then that's sufficient to make out your cause of action. So you actually identify the facts that you intend to prove in the fact pleading jurisdictions. The uh, demur and the 12B6 motion are simply the state and the federal version of uh, you don't have a cause of action. Basically, the, uh, the, plaintiff is saying, the, the plaintiff has filed a cause of action, and the defendant is saying that uh, even if you believe everything that the plaintiff has said, this doesn't state a cause of action. Therefore, please dismiss now. Uh, an example of that might be where the statute of limitations has already run, <coughs> and the, uh, the, the uh, defendant might move to dismiss on the grounds uh, that uh, uh, on the pleadings itself, you're suing the plaintiff about, the plaintiff is suing the defendant about something that happened 15 years ago and the statute of limitations is wrong. Well, the defendant can, uh, be, without, before even answering, can move to dismiss on the grounds that your suit is barred by the statute of limitations and that could be treated as either a demur or a 12B6 motion or also sometimes called a judgment on the pleadings. A motion for judgment on the pleadings is another motion that kind of fits in here. A judgment for motion on the pleadings uh, is really just a, a motion that says, look at the pleadings themselves and they tell you this cause of action doesn't exist anymore. It's more than 15 years old. So a judgment on the pleadings <coughs> um, and a demur and a motion for 12B6. These, uh, Basically, just uh, getting rid of the case before you get any place. Jurisdiction, the court, of course, has to have jurisdiction uh, in order to make a binding decision on the parties who have come before the court. But in order for the court to, <coughs> the court has two kinds of jurisdiction the court is required to have, personal jurisdiction and subject matter jurisdiction. Personal jurisdiction is simply saying that the court, uh, that these people who have come before the court, that the court has uh, all the requirements that have been satisfied so the court can make a decision regarding uh, uh, this person's rights. Uh, a person, for example, who did not get notice of the lawsuit, uh, the court may not have personal jurisdiction to decide what that person's rights are if they didn't even get notice of the lawsuit. <clears throat> or as a second example, suppose even though the person got notice of the lawsuit, the person lives in the state of Vermont and you're suing them in California and they have no contacts with the state of California. They haven't been here, they haven't sent anything here, they don't want to come here. Uh, and you're suing them in Vermont saying, come here and defend. Well, that court might very well not have personal jurisdiction because over uh, the person in that setting. And so, uh, jurisdiction, the court must have personal jurisdiction over the people involved and subject matter jurisdiction over the nature of the dispute. Uh, the subject matter jurisdiction in federal court can be, as shown here, either <coughs> there is a federal question, people are disputing 
uh, regarding some federal law or the treaty, <coughs> there's a federal question that would give the federal court subject matter jurisdiction, and or if the person, people are before the federal court based on diversity, if they have the proper amount and the sufficient diversity of citizenship. The, uh, so we want to look at this material here more closely. Some of this other material will come up in today's lecture and we'll talk about it as it comes up. So let's begin with the question of personal jurisdiction. What is required in order for a court to be able to exercise jurisdiction over a person and to have that enforceable. It's a binding uh, decision. First of all, <coughs> the plaintiff who comes to court and files a lawsuit uh, 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 grants the court, they, they consent to the jurisdiction of the court. If you go to the court and you personally file a complaint, then you're asking for the court's help in resolving your dispute and you're granting jurisdiction by consent. So it's not the plaintiff that we have the problem with, it's the defendant. When does the court have jurisdiction over the defendant? And here uh, are the requirements for that to happen. For the court to have personal jurisdiction over the defendant, there are three requirements shown here. And these three requirements are <coughs> that the court, the defendant, the court must have a proper basis for the decision. What this means really is that the defendant has to have, can't be that person that I hypothetically talked about a minute ago who lives in Vermont. Well, the court, the person that the court's going to make a decision about, that person needs to have some contacts with your state. If a person has no contacts with your state and you're going to make a judgment about them and never been here, don't want to be here, and so forth, well, that would violate due process. It's not fair and the judgment would not be enforceable because it would violate due process. But if the, so what basis means here is that in order for the court to exercise jurisdiction over a defendant, that the, the defendant must have sufficient contacts with the state in order for, uh, in order to not violate due process. So this basis really is sufficient contacts with the state. That makes sense. And of course these rules over here are designed to sort of uh, uh, help decide uh, if, if the person has some contacts, is that enough? Well, these are the rules about how much contact the person has to have. So the basis is proper, con adequate contact with the court. The long-arm statute, uh, if the person is uh, living in Vermont, as in my hypothetical a minute ago, and the court wants to exercise jurisdiction over them, well, let's suppose that the person who lives in Vermont, in Vermont does have some contacts with your state. Let's say your state is California. The person in Vermont does have some contacts, and let's suppose they have enough contacts so the court can exercise jurisdiction over that person in Vermont. Well, the problem though is that the person is in Vermont and our California Constitution, or the Constitution of any state, is going to give its courts the authority to exercise jurisdiction over people in that state, but not people outside of the state. I mean, the New Mexico courts cannot exercise jurisdiction over people in Florida, and the, t the courts in, in Japan cannot exercise jurisdiction over people in California, and so forth. And so, uh, if the person is a non-resident, how does your local court get the authority to reach out and exercise jurisdiction over somebody way over there? And the answer is that uh, for the first thing you have to do is to compel the person to return here to defend. And so even if the local court, California, sends a subpoena to somebody in Vermont saying come back here and defend because you have enough contacts for us to exercise jurisdiction over you, well that person in Vermont is not in California. And if you're sending them a Vermont subpoena, well why should they have to obey anything? that a California court says, uh, and because they are, it's beyond the reach of the California court. And what these long-arm statutes do is by either the state constitution or the state statute, it extends the jurisdiction of the court just beyond the borders of the court, just enough to uh, require a person in Vermont to obey that subpoena. 
if they, if they have enough contacts with California, so that uh, then California, if the person in Vermont has enough contacts, then the California uh, subpoena sent to that person saying, come back here and defend, the long arm statute authorizes the courts to do that, and so that that, long, that uh, subpoena is now valid. And if they don't come back here and defend, then you'll, the plaintiff in California will get a default judgment, and that default judgment will be uh, exercisable. You can enforce it any place, including Vermont. It's entitled to full faith and credit. But if the California courts did not have proper jurisdiction, then the judgment in the California courts would not be entitled to full faith and credit in other courts. Furthermore, the judgment even in the California courts, you could go up to the Supreme Court and get it overturned here. So you need these long-arm statutes in order for the state courts to reach uh, beyond its boundaries just far enough to make people come back and defend, meaning that if they don't come back and defend, the default judgment will be good. Now, that works for the state courts. When you're in federal court based on diversity, the federal courts in California, for example, if you're suing on diversity, the federal courts in California would use the same we use the California long-arm statute. So if the California courts have the authority to reach somebody in Vermont and tell them come back and defend or we'll get a valid default judgment against you, if the California courts could do that, then in a diversity case, the, the, uh, uh, the federal courts in California could do the same thing, sitting in diversity. So the California, the federal courts use the long-arm statutes of the state where they're sitting. And finally, notice, of course, the defendant has to get notice in order for uh, it uh, to be bound by the lawsuit. It would be fair, un unfair. So we need to exercise jurisdiction over a defendant. We need a proper basis, a long-arm statute, and notice. Now, please notice that if the defendant is a local resident, you don't need the, the long-arm statute. Uh, you have a basis, you don't need the long-arm statute, but you do need the notice. So let's talk more about these contacts because on bar exam questions, this is uh, one of, this is the big issue. Whether or not the defendant has sufficient contacts with the forum state so that they got to go there and defend or the default judgment is going to be enforceable. There are two sets of contacts that are used. One are the traditional contacts, we call these traditional bases. They really are contacts. The traditional set of contacts, and modernly, we have a more loose set of contacts which can be used. The traditional contacts are the traditional basis, which have been sufficient to give the court's jurisdiction, have historically been the, if a person is domiciled in your state, that certainly is enough uh, basis, enough contacts for the court to exercise jurisdiction. Somebody who lives here in the state, certainly if you give them notice, the court can exercise jurisdiction. And in fact, uh, as we'll come back and talk about this in a minute, you get general jurisdiction over that person. Secondly, if a present person is in your state present when served, doesn't matter how temporarily they may be present when served, if they are in fact present when served in the state, then they, uh, if they are present when served, then uh, uh, we can ex the court can exercise general jurisdiction over them. Now, when I say general jurisdiction, let me explain a little bit more about that. Uh, general jurisdiction is the jurisdiction that uh, 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 where the court can can uh, uh, exercise jurisdiction of the person for anything they did any place in the world. If you go to the South Pole and commit a tort and come back to California. If California has general jurisdiction, you can be sued over that tort at the South Pole, and that's still, and the judgment will be valid. Uh, general jurisdiction, uh, where a specific jurisdiction is jurisdiction over a particular transaction, but not over other things. For example, a court might have specific jurisdiction over a particular contract, a particular automobile accident, or some other particular event, the court may have general ju specific jurisdiction over that event, but nothing else. You see that in situations where a person living in Florida and they came to California, 
had a car accident and went back to Florida. They came to California and entered into a contract locally and then went back to Florida. And now there's a lawsuit. Well, you can see how that person in Florida has had enough contacts in California regarding the automobile accident that a court in California ought to be able to adjudicate that accident and say who's at fault and who owes. Likewise for the contract that was formed here in California. But the person in Florida, in my hypothetical, has no other contacts with California, no other contacts beyond, beyond that car accident or the contract. And so it would be unfair for the California courts to exercise jurisdiction over that person regarding anything else except those events for which they have the contacts. So we, if you can exercise general jurisdiction over a person, means you can exercise jurisdiction over them over anything they did any place in the world, specific jurisdiction limited to particular transactions. Here on the board, if a person is domiciled in California, uh, you are like most of us here are residents in California, our courts can exercise general jurisdiction over us, meaning they can exercise jurisdiction over us for anything we did anywhere in the world. Likewise, for a press person who was present when served, even if they're on a train passing through California, probably even in an airplane flying over California, if they're here uh, and served while they're here, can get general jurisdiction. Obviously, the defendant can consent to jurisdiction of the local courts, but if the defendant consents to jurisdiction, then California gets jurisdiction over the defendant only to the extent that the person consented. If you consented, if you enter into a contract with someone and you consent saying, if we have to litigate, we agree to the, cons to the jurisdiction of the Nevada courts. Well, that's consent uh, to, for the uh, Nevada courts to exercise jurisdiction. They then have jurisdiction over that transaction, but not anything else. So specific, so consent, of course, will give uh, limited jurisdiction, will give you specific jurisdiction over whatever was consented. So traditionally, these are the kinds of contacts which were recognized as a sufficient contacts for the court to exercise jurisdiction over someone. They live here, they were here when served, they consented to the jurisdiction. Modernly, we have other kinds of contacts which are sufficient for the court to exercise jurisdiction. First, if a defendant has systematic and continuous activities in the state, uh, that will get you general jurisdiction. I'll write the word general along with this here. If the court has uh, uh, systematic, if the uh, defendant has systematic and continuous activity in the state, that'll get you general jurisdiction. Uh, here, I'll move this board, and you'll see the remainder of this layout here. By the way, let me uh, tell you that when I have put material on the board in advance of the uh, class starting, do not feel that when you first turn on your, your monitor, you've got to copy everything off the board. I will always go through the material on the board very slowly, methodically, so that you can make your notes and draw the diagrams as we talk about them, rather than feeling like you've got to copy it all. Because sometimes there's a lot of material on the board, but it will always be covered very slowly, very methodically. You can make the notes as we go. Here we're talking about uh, jurisdiction. We've said that uh, the basis, that is what contacts person has, we have modern bases along their traditional bases and modern bases. The modern bases, one of them is systematic and continuous activities in the state. If a defendant such as a corporation, for example, uh, it doesn't have to be a corporation, by the way, but if a corporation uh, does not, uh, doesn't, is not headquartered here, and this is not their principal place of business, but Let's suppose that this corporation always has personnel and facilities that are constantly present right here in the state of California all the time. They're constantly present here. Well, look at IBM as an example. IBM is headquartered back east someplace, and uh, California is not their principal place of business either. 
But don't you agree that, Cal that IBM has presence in the state of California all the time? They got facilities and personnel. They got employees here all the time. Uh, General Motors, lots of corporations. You don't have to get that big, but there are lots of corporations that have facilities and personnel who are here in the state all the time. And so for those cases where some modernly, if someone has system, a, a corporation or an individual has systematic and continuous activities in the state, we treat them just like they're domiciled here. And after all, IBM has more contacts with the state than you and I do individually. Uh, so if the, uh, now to have systematic and continuous, what we mean here is that that uh, company usually has personnel or facilities which are systematically and continuously in the state. Uh, an example of that might be a trucking company. A trucking company with headquarters in Nebraska and principal place of business someplace else, but they have so many trucks that at any time of the day, 365 days a year, they've got a number of trucks that are on the roads in California. Uh, and so that trucking company probably has systematic and continuous activities in the state of California. That means that we can, you can treat them just as though they're domiciled here. You can sue them for practically anything that they could have been sued for if they had been domiciled here. So uh, systematic and continuous activities, you can get general jurisdiction over that uh, defendant. Now the second class of defendants under the Martin standards here, systematic and continuous we just talked about, are the ones where a defendant has certain minimum contacts with the state. This is the case where we're going to get only specific jurisdiction. Minimum contacts, this is the case of the person from Florida who comes to California, has a car accident, and goes back to Florida, or comes to California and enters into a contract and goes back to Florida. Well, that person has obviously limited contacts with California, but you still want to be able to sue them over uh, causes of action that came out of that car accident or causes of action that came out of that contract here in California. And the way the system is set up to allow those suits is we say uh, to decide whether or not you can exercise jurisdiction over someone that has these minimum contacts in the state, what we do is we go here and we use these factors to make that decision. First, that if, the, if you want to sue this Florida defendant uh, who came to California, hit your car and went back, you want to sue this Florida defendant, we look to see if that, purpose, that person has purposely availed themselves of some benefits of the state of California. They purposely avail themselves of some benefits of the forum state. Now, in, uh, in the case of the person who came to California in their, from Florida in their car and had an accident and went back, well, they benefited by using the roads of the state of California. They came here and used our roads. It's very expensive to build and maintain these roads. And they came here and made use of them and had an accident while they're making use of those roads. So uh, that person did purposely avail themselves of some benefits. How about a person who solicits customers from the state of California? This person uh, sells widgets uh, and over the internet they place lots of ads and they get a fair amount of business coming from the state of California. Well, uh, if California is a part of their market where they normally sell stuff here, then they are viewed as getting a purposefully getting a benefit out of the state because they're getting money out of the state. They're selling their stuff here and getting money back for it. And that's viewed as them uh, getting a benefit out of the state because we're part of their market. A person who uh, sells used cars on the internet and they, uh, they have a, a, a national market and they sell lots of cars in California. People in California call them all the time or, or communicate with them all the time. 
and they, they uh, somehow or other sell cars to people in California. Well, that person is, and they get paid for that. Well, that person is, uh, California is part of their market, and they are purposely benefiting from the citizens of the state by getting money from them. So uh, that works. A person who sends lots of uh, gadgets into the state of California, they sell valves or bicycles or whatever it is, and they send a lot of them in here and get money back, that purpose person is purposefully availing themselves of the benefits of the state. Now, a person who makes an isolated transaction, when you own a private car in Oklahoma and you sell it to someone in California, well, California isn't really part of your marketplace. It's not seen as purposefully availing yourself of the benefits just because you sold one car here. It's got to be more than that. It cannot be just an isolated event. Purposeful availment. Secondly, nexus. Now this nexus is just a, a fancy word for saying that the cause of action, and we're talking specific jurisdiction here all the way through, we're not talking general jurisdiction. So the cause of action must arise out of the purposeful availment. Okay, and so that in the case of the car accident, the purpose person was here using the roads, the car accident arose out of using the roads. The person was uh, selling widgets to people in California, and what do you know, one of the widgets broke and someone got injured here. And so then this, this uh, second element is simply saying the cause of action must arise from the purposeful availment. That makes sense. So these are the first two requirements in deciding if we will exercise specific jurisdiction. Number three is the foreseeability. Foreseeability simply requires <coughs> that uh, the one mu it must be foreseeable that whatever you're doing that is purposely availing yourself of the benefits of California, you need to, that whatever you are doing, it must be foreseeable to a reasonable person that if you do that, you may very well have to go to the state of California and defend. And for example, suppose you are a car dealer uh, who sells cars in New York. You sell Volkswagens in New York. And you sell a Volkswagen to someone who literally tells you, I'm going to take this Volkswagen to Oklahoma where I live. And indeed, you sell them a car and they take off and drive the car to Oklahoma. They get to Oklahoma and they say the car was defective in some way, caused them an accident, and now they're suing to recover for that accident. But they want you in New York to come to Oklahoma where the accident happened and defend. They don't want to have to come to New York and sue you. And your defense, of course, if you're the New York car dealer in Worldwide Volkswagen, the case we all know about, uh, <coughs> the uh, car dealer is now going to say, uh, I did not purposely avail myself of any benefits of the state of Florida, of uh, Oklahoma. I haven't been to Oklahoma. I don't know anything about it, don't want to go there. This Oklahoma resident came here and bought a car from me, but I didn't go there, and Oklahoma is not a part of my normal market, so I have not purposely availed myself of any benefits of the forum state. And uh, uh, the, the nexus, of course, if uh, the nexus doesn't work unless you have the purposeful availment. And the so purpose is I don't have this, I don't have that, and then foreseeability. Uh, the test now is, is, was it foreseeable that uh, you may have to go to Oklahoma and defend? Well, when you look at this case that I just told you about, the plaintiff is going to say, well, you say, car dealer, you did not purposely avail yourself of any benefits, but you sold a car to a person who you knew was going to go to Oklahoma with that car. And the courts are saying, yep, you did that all right. But that doesn't, if you, if you had shipped that car to Oklahoma, maybe it should be foreseeable that you may have to go there and defend. But if they came here and bought it, that even if, <coughs> even if you looked at that as benefiting yourself uh, by getting money from a citizen that you know is from that state, that generally is not, not, not enough. But even if that were treated as enough, 
that the foreseeability issue is still here, and that is that it simply isn't foreseeable that if you, so somebody comes to your state and they buy something and take your stuff back to another state that you got to go there and defend. It just isn't foreseeable. Now, I can create a situation where it probably is foreseeable. For example, suppose you are a person who makes very expensive turbines for generating electricity. They cost about $10 million a piece. And a, uh, someone in Massachusetts wants one of these turbines. And they contract with you, and you come to California. They come to California, and you build a turbine, and they send inspectors out and watch various steps in the process. And when you finally get the turbine built, they, they bring the freight trains up to your place, and they put it on the freight train, or you, maybe you put it on the train, and then they take it away to Massachusetts and install it in Massachusetts. While it's in Massachusetts, something goes wrong and someone gets injured, and they claim the turbine was defective, and they want you to come to Massachusetts and defend. Well, you can see with the magnitude of a contact that large, millions of dollars worth of stuff, even though it's only one item that, was, that they came here and bought from you, that that's a large enough contact that don't you agree that it's now foreseeable that if somebody claims that the turbine was defective and they got injured, you may be required to go there and defend. So you can see the foreseeability element. In fact, the Supreme Court seems to, in some cases, just treat the whole, all of this stuff as foreseeable. That is, you, uh, uh, the purposeful availment, uh, obviously, you, you can look at various facts and sort of turn it into a purposeful availment purposeful availment nexus, but it really, the, the, they have it turn on foreseeability in the sense that if it was foreseeable, if it was foreseeable that whatever you did, you may have to go there and defend, that this stuff here is treated as like a subcategory of foreseeability. That foreseeability becomes the major standard, and this is simply a component of it. But either way you want to do that, uh, is not particularly important, but foreseeability becomes important. You can see that foreseeability really is based on common sense. It turns on the magnitude of the contact, how often do you contact with them, what is the nature of the contact. If you, if you send uh, one uh, pencil to uh, uh, Massachusetts, even if you send it there, you're probably not going to have to go back there and defend. But if you send 100,000 pencils per year and some, one of them was broken, they punctured somebody in the eye, you may have to go back there and defend. Uh, on the other hand, if you send dynamite to Massachusetts, you don't send nearly so much dynamite, but dynamite is dangerous. And if someone gets injured because of that, you can see that it is more likely that the court would make you come back to Massachusetts and defend if you're sending dynamite there than if you are sending, uh, you're sending pencils or bed clothing or something of that sort there. So the foreseeability then turns on these kinds of common sense factors. How often are you sending stuff back there? What is the nature of the stuff you're sending? Is it dynamite or bed clothing? Uh, is it, uh, uh, is it a, uh, how, how large, I mean, how big an item is uh, you know, the magnitude of the contact? So foreseeability. And the final factor here is fair, what uh, actually the, uh, uh, what is actually called fair play and substantial justice. Uh, the, uh, under fair play and substantial justice, what we're looking at here is that in order for the court to exercise jurisdiction over this non-resident, that here under this item four, what the court said in cases like Worldwide Volkswagen is that before you get to this issue of fair play and substantial justice, you must have satisfied these first three. That is to say, the court must in effect have jurisdiction and deciding whether it wants to exercise it or not. 
the, uh, uh, the whole idea of this minimum contacts concept under the old case of international shoe that you all know about, that the idea there is that if you go if the if the court is going to exercise jurisdiction over somebody that's out of state, they got to have enough contacts for it to be fair, just basically fair. This whole thing is about due process. So you have to have enough contacts for so it's, it's fair. In fact, the language the court used is fair play and substantial justice to require a non-resident to come back and defend. And so what happened over the years that this concept of fair play and substantial justice, the court says, well, okay, this is kind of a fuzzy concept, but here's some stuff you got to have. You got to have this, number one. You got to have this item two. You got to have this item three. Well, even though you have these, it still may not be fair to make the person come back and defend. Uh, for example, you take a, a concept like justice. Well, uh, we know that to have justice in our legal system, you need to have certain minimum requirements. You need the person who is making the decision needs to be a, a disinterested party, you know, not with an, uh, not an interest on either side. Uh, and but uh, in the case of our jury system, you need a, a jury maybe that as a, a jury of disinterested members of your community. But don't you agree that even if you got a neutral magistrate and you got a fair jury, that you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily going to get justice. There's all kinds of other things that can go wrong. So even though you could have some minimum requirements saying to get justice, you must have these things. Just because you have those things doesn't mean you got justice. You still need some wiggle room. And that's what this, this category is here, that even if you have items one, two, and three, it still may not be just for the court to exercise jurisdiction, so you still have this left over. The factors which go taken into account here, first of all, the state's interest and convenience of the parties, location of the evidence. Now, the, uh, for example, the state's interest, there are some cases where the state has a lot more interest in the case than others. For example, uh, in an insurance case, if a uh, company back east in uh, uh, Ohio or someplace, there's an insurance company there, and <clears throat> they've got a, uh, a they have they issue automobile insurance, and you are the only customer they have in California. And you have a fender bender worth about $500 to repair. And you say to the insurance company, please repair. And they say, no, uh, we're not going to. You say, well, then I'm going to file a lawsuit. They say, fine, come back here to Ohio and sue us over the $500. Well, you can see how impractical that is. So what would happen practically is that <clears throat> you just never get your car repaired because you're not going to do that unless you can sue them here in California. Well, when you try to sue them here in California, their defense might very well be, well, gee, we, that's not a part of our marketplace, that we don't normally do that much in California. We have only one, you're the only customer we got. It's not, we're not advertising and selling. In fact, what really happened in the case I'm referring to, Texas uh, McGee versus Texas International Insurance, what happened is that the insurance policy was sold back east and the person moved to California. And so the my hypothetical Ohio insurance company was really a Texas insurance company and the plaintiffs were McGee. And the McGee's moved to California, had life insurance policy, the policy had been purchased in Texas and the person died in California and after they died in California <clears throat> the insurance company in Texas wouldn't pay so they sued the insurance company in California. And the insurance company says, we don't have any other contacts. And California says, that doesn't matter, that the state has such a high interest in making sure that its uh, citizens can sue insurance companies that do business in this state, that, we, that your one contact is enough. Like the automobile dented fender, that's enough. You can sue them here. So there are cases where the state has a strong interest in providing a forum, uh, 
convenient to the parties is self-explanatory, location of evidence, self-explanatory. So if you have if you have all the first three, then if and only if you have the first three of these, then you look to see if you have the fourth one. And then if you have all four, then the minimum contacts requirement is satisfied, and we now, under these Martin standards, <coughs> have enough contacts so the court has a sufficient basis to exercise jurisdiction over the defendant. So uh, if you want to know whether or not you have enough basis, look first for the traditional basis. See if you've got this. If you don't have that, look for the Martin basis. Look for this one. And if you don't have that one, go for this one. When you go for this one, you must look at all four of these. If you have all four of these, then you have specific, not general jurisdiction. And that satisfies the basis that's required for jurisdiction. Remember that jurisdiction requires over a defendant requires a basis, and we've been talking about the basis. It also requires a long-arm statute if the defendant is a non-resident and notice. So let's take a 10-minute break and come back and pick up on some of the others.